Grace and peace be with you from God, our Creator, and our Savior, Jesus Christ. It's wonderful to be with you this morning, even virtually it's wonderful to be with you. I give thanks for all the things you do for our Lord and this part of God's uh, kingdom. I have to say, uh, you do so many things, I'm not going to list them, you all know what they are anyway, but I think you're the only church I know of that has anything to do with bees, so... Um, and I want to say, I think that's a wonderful thing. I happen to be allergic to bee stings, so it's, it's sort of an iffy thing for me, but I think it's very cool that you're engaged in it. Um, and I give thanks to your clergy and their leadership. I give thanks for uh, your creativity. So here we are on Pentecost. Let's just remember that 10 days ago, Jesus was lifted into the heavens. And his instructions to the disciples weren't actually that helpful. He said, you will receive the Holy, you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. Of course, he didn't tell them what kind of power. He didn't tell them when this event was happened. And the truth is he didn't really tell them what the Holy Spirit was. So here they are 10 days later and they aren't exactly sure of how to go forward. Should they go back to being faithful Jews? Should they return to the temple and embrace the holiness code? And if they did, what would they do with all these other folks that had gathered around Jesus? The list we heard today, Egyptians, Libyans, Cretans, Arabs, because before they connected with Jesus, they had nothing to do with these people. They thought they were unclean. They thought they were pagans and and they felt like if they touched these folks and they were unclean, somehow they would become unclean. The truth is they just sort of didn't belong in, in the club. I mean, they didn't recycle. They didn't know how to follow the prayer book. They didn't wear masks during COVID. They didn't like kids in their church services. So the disciples are sort of figuring out, what do we do with these people? How do we treat them now? As I thought about this, I, what came to me was how you feel when you go to your first dance in middle school, because you just gather around the room in these clumps. Definitely the boys gather with boys, the girls gather with girls, but then there are all these subgroups. The nerds hang out with the nerds, the jocks hang out with the jocks, the cool kids hang out with the cool kids and so on. And they look across the room at each other but they can't figure how to cross that divide. And they don't even know if it's a good idea that the divide is crossed. They, some, they have some idea about what it means to dance, but they have no idea how to get from the idea, the conception to the reality itself. And so they just go to the corners and they stay there. Part of them definitely wants to leave, to leave the corners, but they don't know how. I kind of think of our country, if you just sort of use this metaphor and apply it to a bigger picture. So this is where we were today as Pente the day of Pentecost began. Everyone was sort of scattered out as if they were in middle school. The Jews were with the Jews, Parthenians with the Parthenians, the Elamites with the Elamites, and things aren't really going so well. Because without Jesus, they do what we always do. They start blaming each other. They start calling the other people heretics or worse. But then something happened, and that something is why we are here today. The wind began to blow. At first, it was just a little breeze, and then it began to howl, and hats flew off, and people scattered, and it blew people off their feet, and it pushed them towards the center. And they discovered that they had to hold on to each other for dear life. They discovered that deeper than their differences, they found that the love of the Lord bound them together. And suddenly they discovered a holy communion that was deeper than they had ever envisioned. And, the, and in that moment, they captured a vision for the world. They got a glimpse of God's wish for all of us to be connected. God's dream of the new Jerusalem. That's the holy city where all God's people are, are with one another. They leave the corners and they all they have to do for 
all their lives are sing God's praises. We must be clear about God's mission for God's church. And if you have forgotten it, grab your little prayer book, go to the very back of it, and all the answers are in the back of the book. And so in the catechism, it says, the mission of the church is to restore all people, all people to unity with God and each other in Christ. And all means all. We don't have to love each other. We don't even have to like each other, but we have to know how to treat the other person as if they were the face of Jesus in the world. And if we don't, we will not only not know the Lord, but we will not be instruments so that the world will come to know the Lord because we'll all just stay in our corners. So how do we get there? Well, it's sort of good news, bad news. It's all grace. It's all a gift from God. It's all of our receiving that grace and then responding in kind. We cannot make the Holy Spirit appear. But when the Holy Spirit does appear, we can embrace that and we can transform our lives and act accordingly. Now, I don't know about you, but for me, I love this story of Pentecost, but I always have a hard time of translating into what would it actually look like in this time, in this context. So I came across an example. I have to tell you that um, I am a huge fan of the poet Naomi Shahib Nye. Uh, she uh, is mainly a poet, but she writes some essays. And, and she wrote an essay that I want to use as an example for what I think our calling is. So she lives in New Mexico. And she writes that one uh, day she was flying out of the Albuquerque airport. And she heard that her flight had been delayed. And then she heard an announcement that said, if anyone is in the vicinity of gate 4A, and that person understands Arabic, please come to the gate immediately. Now, what are the chances that someone's going to understand Arabic in the Albuquerque airport? But the thing is, Naomi Shahid Nye spoke Arabic. And so she goes to the gate and she found an older woman who was in traditional Palestinian embroidered dress. And this woman was simply wailing. The airline official said that when they announced that the flight was delayed, this person went into hysterics. And so Naomi put her arm around the woman and began to speak to her in Arabic. Immediately, the woman stopped crying because she, had, she thought that her flight had been canceled indefinitely and she needed to be in El Paso for a major medical treatment the next morning. To help her relax, Naomi got the num phone number of her son and she called him and she told her son that she would be willing to stay with uh, his mother until the flight left. And if she could, she would sit with her on the plane because they were on the same flight. This is what she writes in her essay, quote, I looked around that gate of late and weary ones, and I thought, this is the world I want to live in, the shared world, end quote. Before getting on the plane, Naomi calls some Palestinian poets she knew, she's a very smart woman, and gave the phone to this woman, and they talked uh, in Arabic, and they laughed. And, and because the woman was able to so relax, she reached into the uh, sack she had and she pulled out some homemade mamu cookies, which are little, little powdered sugar crumbly mounds stuffed with dates and nuts. And she began offering them to all the women at the gate. This is what Naomi Shai Nye writes. Quote, to my amazement, not one single woman declined it was like a sacrament. The traveler from Argentina, the mom from California, the lovely woman from Laredo, we were all covered with the same powdered sugar. And there's no better cookie. 
and we were all smiling. Then the airline broke out with free beverages from huge coolers and two little girls on the flight ran around serving us apple juice and they were covered with powder sugar too. And I noticed my new best friend, by now we were holding hands. And I looked around the gate of the late and weary ones and thought, this is the world I want to live in. It's the shared world. Not a single person in this gate seemed apprehensive about any other person. This is the important one. This can happen anywhere. Not everything is lost. My brothers and sisters, it is easy for us to hear the story of Pentecost and think, well, that's a sweet story, but that happened a long time ago. Or we can say, well, yeah, miracles can happen when it's close to Jesus' resurrection, but not now, not here. We know better than that. And the word for that kind of perspective is despair. We either believe in God's power to change the world or we don't. And if God is God, then God's grace, mercy can happen anywhere. It can happen in the Albuquerque airport. It can happen in Reston, Virginia. We cannot make this happen, but we can be responsive to it when it begins to happen. It can be like talking to a stranger in a strange language until no one is a stranger. It can be like taking what we have to share with one another, even if it's mamul cookies, and then discovering that really is the bread of heaven. The Episcopal theologian Alan Jones once said, quote, you are the veil that hides you from the paradise you seek. You are the veil that hides you from the paradise you seek. We are the veil because we become content with the way the world is. And instead of holding on to God's vision of what the world should be, that is no barriers, that is community and communion, that is the shared world, that's the place where the word becomes flesh and dwells among us and in us and between us. The heaven that we seek can be experienced on this side of the grave. Because the promise Jesus made to us and to all his lovers is, I will be with you always. Pentecost happens in airports. It happens on the streets of Reston, Virginia. All we have to do is to be open to God's grace. All we have to do is to reach out to one another, share our language, share our cookies, share our lives. Remember what we heard this morning? God declares, I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh, all flesh. Let us embrace that. And wherever we are, let us do what we can to allow everyone, all of God's children, to step into the shared world. Amen.